morning. You know, in some of the worldly circles today, the, reli the, the reliability of the Bible might sound like this. The Bible? How can we possibly rely on a 2,000-year-old, out-of-date, irrelevant publication full of contradictions written by so many writers over such a long period of time? Clearly, we cannot, especially since we progressed with the, you know, with the computer so far and gained so much more knowledge and have evolved our minds to such an extent that our forebears are li were limited and limited development and can't ma match or keep pace with us. I'm going to snitch a, a saying from Justice Roberts in the Obergefell gay marriage case. He said, who do we think we are? And I'm going to have more to say about that. Who do we think we are if you had views as to, I just described? Today, however, the hope is to demonstrate that God's word never changes and illustrate that we can and must rely on the word of God. And when we compare the book of Micah with the events, the events of today, we find this. History repeats. History is repeating now in the United States. That we and our beliefs will meet growing, strong resistance. That we must know how to persevere that our perseverance is not to show off for society, but to speak for the audience of one. Ultimately, if we are true to our principles, we will prevail with God on earth and we will all celebrate in heaven with him. The book of Micah and Micah as a person is not someone that I recall anybody in my, uh, rough, I'm not gonna tell you how old I am that I've never really heard anybody preach on the book of Micah, but he, it fits perfectly with this uh, particular subject. Who was he? Well, number one, he was a minor prophet. That doesn't mean he was underage. It means that he, uh, he, he's got a shorter book than some of the bigger uh, prophets. One theologian, position on prophets is that in the strict sense we don't have them today and that is a biblical truth of Christ church he goes on to say that they were around before and during the time of the Bible was written and that they received revelation from God and delivered it to the people people at the time knew that when a genuine prophet spoke it was as good as from the lips of God himself the truth of what they said was the test, and if they spoke falsely, they were put to death. I'd refer you to Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 5, or Jeremiah 14, 15. Micah, however, was a trustworthy prophet. He was a prophet in the period from 750 to 686 B.C., and he was a contemporary of Isaiah, Hosea, Amos, and he was quoted by Jeremiah. He predicted the fall of Samaria in 77, 22, and 21, and the desolation of Judah. He further predicted that both kingdoms would be largely overtaken by Assyria. At that time, Israel was an apostate, in an apostate con condition, as in, as you all know, apostates have fallen away. Many of us in the United States are in an apostate condition. He also condemned violence, corruption, robbery, covetousness, gross materialism, spiritual bankruptcy, and illicit sex. Anything sound familiar? No. Micah alternates between oracles of doom and oracles of hope. He stresses that God hates idolatry, injustice, and empty ritualism. He delights in pardoning the penitent, 
and says Zion to ha will have greater glory in the future. And when Solomon died, civil war divided into two nations, Israel. Israel to the north and Judah to the south. During this period, Judah wavered in its faithfulness to God due to questionable morality of its kings, and Israel consistently pursued evil as an apostate state. These were the social conditions Micah had to deal with. Micah and a multitude of prophets repeatedly warned both Israel and Judah about God's concern about their behavior. By 722 BC, God's patience ended and he allowed Assyria to invade and conquer Israel. Micah saw corruption of the priests, selfishness in the ruling class, and fabrication by false prophets, and he felt the people needed a word from God. If you look in your Bibles in the book of Micah in chapter 3, verses, verse 11, you will find her priests instruct for a price and her prophets divine for money. Do you note any similarity between Israel and the U.S. today? Maybe that two-year-old book ain't so far out of date and as, be it, as it irrelevant as the world argues. From the example above, we can see there are many conditions that existed at Micah's time and that are present and rampant in the United States today. Micah had to stand alone against this false, these false prophets, and maybe we will have to stand alone against the world. As we go in the beginning, I want to read to you how the gospel could be read, and, and, and we, we did that, so we're going to leave that. It just shows you how sometimes 80-year-olds can be forgetful, okay? So. If you'll now turn your, in your Bible to chapter 6 of, of Micah, verse 3. And this is where Micah speaks to Judah. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. And Judah's response is found in chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Judah's people felt they must come to the Lord in a bargaining posture, similar to the capricious gods of Egypt. These false religions all seek favor. They did then, and they do today. With the, with the gods through deeds of service or sacrifice. They went so far as even to sacrificing their firstborn children on the altar of a false god, thus their bartering moved from regular worship to exaggerated reverence, reverence, hyperbole, and then blasphemy. Any similarity there that you can see to some of the TV preachers of today with their feel-good philosophy and their promises of economic wealth? The false religions that I have described are all work-based, and such religions never work. You can't sacrifice enough, work hard enough, pray enough to earn God's pleasure. The Lord will not barter for his favor. His love is not for sale. What the, want, the Lord wants is for his people to do what is right. Love kindness and walk humbly with him. Micah 6.8, to act justly 
and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. As in Micah's time, God expects us to do what is right. God's expectations of us have not changed. Only the world's behavior has changed. And the words of what is expected of us are found in that 2,000-year-old irrelevant book that suddenly becomes very relevant. And they will not change because God never changes. And when Justice Roberts said, who do we think we are? He was saying to us, do we really think we are smarter than God? Man can try to make evil good and good evil, but just because man says it doesn't make it so. Just as man is trying to redefine what God said constituted marriage doesn't mean what that says either. Man's refusal to declare his beliefs and acknowledge the concept of absolute truth will never make absolute truth disappear. And hard and fast rules of appropriate conduct will never bow, even though men wish that to be true. Absolute truth exists, and you can have a direct line to it. I can't say I have any claim on this line to absolute truth but I can say that I've found it and I accept it. The 66 books of the Bible were in inspired by the author of absolute truth, God himself. Now, just as in Micah's time, ungodly men are trying to demand that God toe the line and knuckle under to man's behavior because following the word of God has become inconvenient. As in Micah's time, one wonders when God's patience with us will end. You know, man's attitude reminds me of a line by Val Kilmer playing Doc Holliday in the movie Tombstone. My hypocrisy knows no bounds, and we see it in the U.S. today. Many of our leaders and many of our people in this, in this often self-centered country resemble closely those who occupied Judah and Israel in Micah's time. One commentator said, when wealth and power get into the hands of a few ungodly people, God moves in judgment. He went on to say that the root of our problem is that the power is in the hands of the ungodly. How can we say that this is irrelevant and out of date? We must continue to pray for all our people in the hope that they will turn from the ways they are following and turn to obedience to the will of God. And then you might say, well, what are the costs of obedience? I used to kid people and say, obedience will be when God asks you to go to Africa. But it's not that case. To find this out, we jump forward about 750 years to see that obedience to God was challenged in the Bible, much as it's being challenged in our country today. Those who refuse to recognize God's authority have for thousands of years attempted to silence those who would proclaim it. You know, I heard the other day an LGBTQ representative say, times are changing. If you can't get with it, just shut up. No one with a modicum of knowledge and good sense can deny that history is repeating itself in that regard. And, you know, the effort to silence is nothing new. In fact, it began almost at the time that the, the apostles began to talk to people about Jesus. The, the parts of the Bible that I'm talking about are found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and then verses 17 through 20. And there's a little bit of parallel, you know, language that is not strictly Bible but needs to fill in the, the narrative. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John, 
while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were reaching or were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to, abs to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and elders and teachers of the law in Jerusalem were, were together in Annas, and the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas and John and Alexander and other men of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? And then they said among themselves, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn these men to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. The religious officials in Israel were determined to silence the message of salvation through Christ and destroy anyone who preached it. A multitude of methods are being used today to silence Christians much as they were used in Micah's time. When you watch the media or social media today, the message really never varies. Keep your religion in the church. Don't judge me. Don't try to force your beliefs on me, you bigot. Even simple efforts to protect conscience decisions by Christians are routinely vilified despite the fact that freedom of religion is the first freedom described in our Bill of Rights. And the founders put it first because they felt it was so important. I, I'm going to go on a little rabbit trail. I have a favorite item that I like to push. And Kevin knows because I gave him one. There's a Bible put out called the Founder's Bible. By a guy, the main editor was a David Barton, who's a historian. It has over 100,000 articles Original, original articles from the founders in his private library and has in their first in the Founders Bible, which is an NASB translation of about 88 articles containing quotes and articles about what the founders of this country believed and stood for and wanted us to follow up on. And if you've got kids or grandkids that don't get history taught, and they don't anymore, you, can, you could give them that for Christmas and give them a good start in understanding what our country is all about. If I go back now, we, I want to talk about some of the things that are happening. And, and I call, my, call your attention to the Christian florist and the baker in Colorado. The baker in Col the Colorado, when the Supreme Court ruled on his case for the first time, castigated those people in the government in Colorado in ways so direct I had never read an opinion so strong, and yet the state of Colorado is pursuing him again. They have been vilified and basically have had businesses all but destroyed. And when you look at this passage in Acts that we just considered three things, there are three things that distinguish a godly person when he or she chooses to do what is right. First, observe the confidence of Peter and John. Confidence, not arrogance, because they found security in the Lord, not in, them, in themselves. Second, the authority of Peter and John. They stood on Christ's authority and not on their own. The direct line to absolute truth. Third, the effectiveness of Peter and John. They, are, they conform the conduct to the scriptures and that produces results. Peter and John's behavior exemplifies the first quality of a life well lived. 
The quality of justice is the consistent, unwavering decision to do what is right. And doing what is right allows you to speak and walk with complete confidence. God understands and approves them. Thus you have the courage to obey God rather than people. Today's standards for behavior and doing, doing right, what is, is are the same as they were for Peter and John. This is not an evolving process. It is a process that is established and, and the world would have you believe that it involves and there are people that want to change all of our rules and regulations. We need to pray that we know and understand this concept and rely on our knowledge that God will sustain us with similar courage to stand up to the world's maligning attitudes, going toe to toe and nose to nose with the courage that the Spirit brings. Obedience to God's will will encourage more obedience and grace. However, I must add a warning. Adopting these standards will not lead to fairy tale compliance by all, and preaching the same will not lead to happiness in this world ever after. In this fallen world of ours, no good deed goes unpunished. Obedience, doing what is right, grows opposition and it will develop in direct proportion. Foolish two-dimensional two thinking of the religious elite in Peter and John's time and our leadership today leads the opposition to believe that the followers of Jesus will respond to a coercion that they would and will be discouraged by the loss of personal freedom and personal comforts. We must disavow them of this false notion. The truth of God will always prevail. And now how do we do what's right? First, we need to know what is right. There is a definable absolute truth and it is set forth in God's word the Bible and it will not change let God reveal what is right to you from his word turn in your Bibles to Romans 8 1 and what do you find there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus it's a now thing ladies and gentlemen it's today that these things are working Trust the transforming power of the Holy Spirit to lead you toward what is right. Pray for the wisdom and discern discernment that God, through the Spirit, can get you to accept the right and discard the rest. Heed the wisdom of others who follow Christ and do what is right. Find a seasoned follower of Christ and let his or her experience to become a guide for your journey and clearly expect that you will meet resistance. Peter and John ran into resistance, and our world today will provide the same, and it's doing it as we speak. Doing right will please God, don't forget that. You know, you can lose your popularity, you can, you can lose your opportunities that rightly belong to you, you might be persecuted for taking a stand for the truth. Don't expect to be rewarded. But remember this, God will superintend his plan. When the going gets tough, you're not alone. Peter and, J and John, and by the way, Paul, all were in jails, but they didn't become bitter. They rejoiced. They knew, and we should know, God is in control. And we are fighting for the winning side. That knowledge can make you invincible, hopefully humble, but still invincible. Remember, no matter what resistance and ridicule you receive, you can ignore it because you are seeking the approval of an audience of one. Most of us, aware of it or not, do things with an eye to the approval of some audience or other. Oz Guinness says in his book, The Call, it is not whether we have an audience, but which audience we have. A life lived 
listening to the decisive call of God is a life lived before one audience that trumps all others, the audience of one. To, fall, to follow the call of God is therefore to live before the heart of God. It is to live quorum Deo before the heart of God and thus shifts our awareness, our, our awareness of audiences to the point where only God, our audience of one, counts. And Jesus required us to do this not seeking the public eye, but in secret. John Cotton, a Puritan, said that living before the audience of one tra transforms all our endeavors. He doth it all comfortably, though he meet with little encouragement from man. Whereas an unbelievable heart would be disoriented that he can find no acceptance, but all he doth is taken in the worst part. That is why Christ-centered heroism does not need to be noticed or publicized. The greatest deeds are done before the audience of one, and that's enough. We who live before the audience of one can say to the world, I have only one audience before you. You have nothing, I have nothing to prove, nothing to gain, and nothing to lose. We modern Christians should live as if we were following the guidance of Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter from the Birmingham jail. And I quote, in those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of a popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. And as you all know, mores are the customs and rules of society. General Charles Gordon, a British hero in the recapture of Sudan, was careless alike. Careless alike, I've learned, is British for he he didn't care about. So he was careless like he didn't care about the frowns of men or the smiles of women of life or comfort, wealth, or fame. Gordon wrote, the more one sees of life, the more one feels in order to keep from the shipwreck the necessity of steering by the polar star. In a word, leave it to God alone and never pay attention to the favors or smiles of man. If he, God, smiles on you, neither the smiles or frowns of men can affect, can affect you. So, to close, do you wish to be interdirected by the Holy Spirit rather than other directed by the world? and truly make the one audience decisive, that audience of one? If that's true, listen to the call of Jesus of Nazareth and answer his call. Let's pray. Lord God, through your son sitting next to you on your right hand, advocating for all of us, Please find a way to strengthen our commitment to our faith, to strengthen our courage in speaking our faith, to give us the strength to be obedient and so that we can go out and carry your word to as you directed to us to do. In all these things, we pray in your son's name. Amen.